Okay, uh, good morning everybody and uh, uh, good morning from Colorado. Um, I'm uh, in Estes Park in Colorado, the, uh, uh, the lands belonging to the Arapaho and Ute tribes. And uh, um, I hope wherever in the world or the United States you are that uh, um, you're, you're not too hot. And uh, um, I know several places, we've got uh, um, uh, Briston on the panel here in, in Texas at, at over 100, Craig's over 100, um, Amy, Amy is over 100, I think. No, you're in the 90s, aren't you? Sorry, Amy. The 90s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and just to put it into perspective, at 8,200 feet here, I'm at 75 degrees. Um, so, <laughs> so thankfully, keeping cool. Um, okay, welcome everybody to uh, um, uh, the US Trail Running Conference webinar. My name is Terry Chiplin. I'm the event director for the US Trail Running Conference and, and uh, the organizer and head up the, this webinar series. Um, this webinar is all about uh, um, starting out for, for new or fledgling race directors. Um, or perhaps even uh, um, uh, even race directors who uh, um, who maybe just uh, um, just need a, um, a bit of help and guidance in terms of uh, uh, um, developing their portfolio, their project, their band, their brand, and so on. Um, so thank you to uh, to everybody out there for joining us today. Um, the uh, um, uh, if you're um, if you're having to drop off at any point, then just to let you know that we will uh, we are recording this session and the recording will be available. Um, and I'll share the link for you with our YouTube channel recording tomorrow. Um, so um, without further ado, um, let's just uh, um, uh, say a quick hello to uh, um, Amy Kohler. Um, Amy, if you can give us a wave. Hey. Hi everyone. Hey. Uh, thanks for having me, Terry. Okay, pleasure, pleasure. Great to see you, Amy. And uh, um, where are you calling in from again? I'm calling in from Eastern Pennsylvania, um, Lehigh Valley area. Um, yeah, it's a little warm here today, but it seems like I have a, kind of the best scenario <laughs> other than you, Terry. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, Briston, um, down in the bottom right there. Um, yep, yeah, you're calling in from, from Texas. Um, um, tell us a little bit more about where you are. Uh, I'm in the Dallas Fort Worth area right now. So okay. that's where I'm I'm stationed at just for uh next few days. So Okay, cool, cool. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Good to see you again. And uh Craig Thornley, um calling in from uh, from California. Um I love I love that kitchen view, Craig. That's that's beautiful. <laughs> Hi Terry. As, as I said, this isn't my kitchen view. It's pretty <laughs> close, but uh this is uh, mile forty or so of the Western States Trail called nice. Screw Auger Canyon or Pucker Point. I am in Auburn, California, about a half mile from the finish of Western States. That's where I live. Cool. Not, not a bad place to live, huh? No, it's not. It's pretty no, good. Pretty yeah. good. Pretty good. Okay. So um, without further ado, I'm going to, um, uh, to share my screen here and then we'll get going. So, okay. Hopefully you guys can, uh, um, can see that. Okay. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can see it? Okay, great. Thank you, Craig. Okay, so um, yeah, the uh, this webinar series is uh, presented by our friends at uh, Marathon Printing, and uh, Marathon Printing, we got. A Big thanks to uh, um, to them. They're enabling us to uh, present this series um, without any cost to race directors that are participating, um, and that was uh, I was really pleased when uh, Marathon Printing agreed to uh, uh, to sponsor the series. So uh, big thanks to them. Um, they're probably best known for um, for their bibs, but they also make uh, uh, lots of other things that are um, uh, really useful for race directors. Um, uh, their bibs are really high quality and uh, um, uh, and produce really quickly. Um, I've used them for some races that I'm connected with and uh, um, can give them a, a big photo of thanks and uh, they do an excellent job. Um, but they've also produced things like stickers for the US Trail Running Conference for me, um, bumper stickers and badges and all kinds of things like that as well. Um, so big thanks to, uh, uh, to Ryan and the, uh, uh, and the rest of the crew there. Um, so this, uh, this, this webinar is all about starting out for new race directors event organizers. And uh, we've got uh, three, three excellent panelists sharing their, uh, uh, their wisdoms and, uh, and thoughts with you. So we're looking forward to, uh, um, to hearing from them. Um, so this is a quick run through of what we're gonna be doing 
during the webinar. Um, so uh, start off with um, housekeeping. We've already done some brief introductions, but housekeeping for you. Um, then uh, feel free to use the, uh, um, the question and answer um, uh, module within uh, Q&A within Zoom here. Um, you can also use the uh, use the chat as well. Um, so uh, um, it'd be great if we uh, um, if we had a few people just say hi on the chat. That would be excellent to hear from you. And uh, um, we can take questions as we go through, or we'll have some time at the end as well to uh, um, to have questions from you too. Um, so we're going to run through in this order. We're going to start with Amy, um, and then Briston, and then Craig. Uh, and uh, as I said, I'm going to be I'm going to be moderating and uh, working the way through uh, working the way through this webinar. Um, okay, so we'll start off with uh, um, with Amy, and uh, um, Amy, I love this picture of you. So uh, um, white white face mountain is that is presumably you ran up there, or or is that not? Yes, yeah, I was lucky enough to go up for the vertical K um, just nice. a few weeks ago, and it was awesome. Yeah, cool. Cool. so grabbed a great picture with that. Um, but yeah, thanks thanks for having me, Terry. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to go through how I'm how I'm putting on events and um, how I've done that sustainably. Um, I guess a little bit about me. Um, I'm a trail runner, a mountain runner. Um, I wear a few different hats, but all of them kind of surround uh, the main position of being a race director. Um, currently, I am a race director for Blue Mountain Resort in Pennsylvania. We host local zero carbon trail races. Um, I'm also a race director for Spartan Trail. Um, and recently I have started my own running company called The Running Kind. We host zero carbon trail races as well as promote sustainable resources for runners. Um, so our website is a hub for finding resources in sustainable gear, plant-based nutrition, and sustainable lifestyle products and brands um, for runners to go to and learn how to run more sustainably. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited to go through how I kind of have made my events zero carbon and uh, the steps I took to, to do that. Cool, cool. Amy, just to, um, just to interject there that the, uh, um, so uh, for each of the panelists, I asked them to, uh, um, to come up with some key factors um, that they wanted to share with you as, uh, um, as fledgling or new race directors. And so Amy, knowing, I, knowing her background, then I asked her to specifically um, look at uh, um, approaching things from a, um, from a zero carbon or carbon neutral perspective. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I'm really, uh, I'm really pleased with, uh, um, uh, with, with thinking of you in, in that kind of way, because I think it's so important, you know, that we, um, I think for, for many race directors, they probably follow the same lines that um, new race directors coming in that previous race directors have followed and and we need to be doing things differently so i'm, I'm really uh, um, i'm really pleased that uh, um, yeah you you're, you're going to share your uh, your your wisdoms with us so i'll hand over to you amy thank you terry yeah and i mean the u.s trail conference last year certainly um even pushed me more in this direction i was kind of tiptoeing around it before and now a year later i'm definitely fully um fully surrounded by the idea of making sustainable events. So props to you for, for getting me there, for sure. Um, I guess if you wanna to go to the next slide, we can, we can start off. Um, so when I first started looking into how to make my events carbon neutral, um, the, the first thing that I did was go and calculate our carbon footprint for our events. Um, I did this first with Blue Mountain. Um, I used TerraPass. Um, that uh, carbon footprint calculator is a great way to do it quickly. Um, if you have had an event in the past, you can use your previous event to calculate the carbon footprint. Um, for something like the running kind, I have not actually had my first event yet. So um, I'm using uh, estimations uh, to calculate what I think my carbon footprint will be for that event. Um, just to have an idea of what that looks like, how much carbon emissions one event uh, will be putting out. Um, and that comes from a variety of different places, which you'll see when you go into the carbon calculators. Um, there are scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. The largest actually being scope three, which tends to be transportation of participants to your event. Um, and so that is what I focused on primarily. 
Um, so an example would be if you do the calculation um, and you find that there is one metric ton that you're producing for your event of carbon emissions, then you know you need to offset one metric ton. Um, you can go and you can see how many participants you've had in the past or um, how many you expect to have for the running kind. Our first event is capped at 100 people. So I'm using that estimation, um, but you can use whatever your average number of participants is in your event um, or your year prior. Um, so in this example, uh, one metric ton could be anywhere from 10 to $20, depending on what uh, carbon offset company you're using. Um, so if, there, if it's $15, you take that number and you divide it by the number of participants, and that's the amount you want to collect per participant um, to ensure that you're, you'll have enough um, money set aside to purchase carbon offsets. Um, you can also ask for donations, which is something I do at Blue Mountain. Um, I don't include a, a set fee that everyone has to pay when they run. Um, I just ask for a $2 donation that goes towards carbon offsets um, and runners can elect to do that or not to do that. Um, whereas with the running kind, everyone will pay, I think it's 50 cents extra on their um, on their race entry to ensure that we are carbon neutral. Um, TerraPass is a great resource. Um, they tend to have a, a more financially feasible um, price that you can still get that reliability of where your money is going and what carbon offsets um, are going towards. Native Energy, I actually learned about through Terry and the US Trail Conference. They've been fantastic working with them through the running kind. Um, and they have specific projects that you can donate to. So um, the our representative we've been working with, uh, we're chatting about what kind of project I'm looking to put the funds towards. And that's gonna allow me to give that information to runners. Um, so they know where their money is going as well. Um, all right, yeah, I think if you wanna go to the next slide. Um, so the second kind of aspect of hosting a zero carbon trail race, after you have your calculations um, and kind of have the participant travel side accounted for, um, you can look at the materials you're using. Uh, for Spartan, and now for all of my races, I use uh, reusable fiberglass marking stakes. They're three feet tall, they have reflective uh, toppers on them and they're great. They have held up for, I think I'm on year three of race directing now and um, they're fantastic. Uh, I use them every race with biodegradable tape um, and uh, that has lowered my carbon footprint, carbon offset, or sorry, carbon emissions for each event just by using the same materials. Um, obviously, going cupless is a huge uh, movement right now. Um, I instruct runners to bring their own fluids for the race. Um, I do host smaller events, anywhere from 30 to 100 people. So it is feasible for me to do that when you're hosting large scale events. Um, maybe more research has to go into that um, and what that looks like, what materials you're you're getting for uh, water stations and um, aid stations. Um, also at all my races, I have a trash recycle, TerraCycle and compost option. Uh, specifically for the running kind, I developed these four categories. They seemed easy. I have four trash bins that are all labeled um, and uh, just providing options. I learned through the US Trail Conference that Goo Energy provides a TerraCycle um, option. So I've been working with them and that has been fairly seamless so far. Um, and then in addition, I try to always make sure I'm looking into the sponsors that are partnering with me um, and making sure that they have environmental uh, policies and sustainable procedures put into place. Um, so that I know our values align. 
Uh, all right, next slide. Transportation. This I kind of touched in on a bit um, in the first slide. Um, so your emissions calculation um, is going to be mostly influenced by transportation to get to an event, where runners are coming from, if they're flying, if they're driving, the general radius they're coming from. Um, like I said earlier, you kind of have two options with this. You can opt for a runner donation um, and um, I would say in my experience, maybe about 30% of my runners choose to donate uh, per race. Uh, and sometimes that number is higher and sometimes it's lower, but on average, that's kind of where my events fall. This obviously uh, depends on where you're at, um, what your community is passionate about and who's running your races. Um, the other option would be just to add a price increase, which is what I'm doing to the for the running kind. Um, this is a very small price increase. Usually it will be unless your uh, carbon emissions are that high, but um, I wouldn't say it's ever going to exceed maybe two to three dollars per person. Um, so that price increase is added for the running kind registration. Um, there's a little blurb about where it's going. And um, once we have an official project picked with Native Energy, we'll, we'll go and, uh, and post that um, so runners can see where exactly that price increase is going. Um, yeah, like I said, about one in five typically donate. Um, so definitely take into consideration where you're located and um, what that looks like for your community. Um, my general rule of thumb is I typically increase the donation amount. Um, if you're asking for a donation and not just adding a price increase, you want to account that not everyone will be um, choosing that option. And so if one in five runners are typically donating, you want that amount to be around five times the amount that you need, um, which still, as you can see, for one metric ton of carbon, if it's 15 cents per, um, per person, that still only equates to about a dollar uh, per registrant to donate, which is feasible for most. All right, last slide. This is actually an area I've seen a lot of success in um, recently. When I first started uh, making my races zero carbon, I uh, reached out to Souls for Souls, uh, which was a sneaker organization that I found online just in general research. Um, and we got around, I think, 150 to 200 donate sneaker donations for a race I held in the winter, which actually offset the race completely. Um, so these um, donation drives can definitely be a additional carbon neutral or put you into the carbon negatives when you're having an event. Um, and they're just great for community building and um, repurposing materials. Um, currently, I'm doing an electronics drive with Human IT. Um, that has also been very easy. Souls for Souls and Human IT pay for the shipping that um, you're putting out for the items. So. Um, Working with them has been great. It really requires little to no effort on my end other than putting the information out to the runners or the general community and accepting donations. Um, and like I said, it's it could completely offset your event or put a good dent in, in those offsets. Um, you can partner with local, local organizations. Um, a recent idea I had for my next event was some type of blanket donation drive for a local animal shelter. Um, any of these things will have a negative carbon footprint in most cases. So um, when you go to calculate them or work with a representative from one of these companies to calculate them, um, they can really help ensure that you're achieving carbon neutrality, which is a great peace of mind um, when you know, you're not sure who's going to donate or um, what that looks like if it's your first time trying to go carbon neutral. Um, yeah, so I think those are my top four things of like how to make your event carbon neutral. Um, 
basically calculations, what materials you're using and what you're doing with your waste, nonprofit organizations, and um, oh, I forget what my third one was. Can you go back a slide? Ah, and transportation, which was kind of the same as the first one. Um, but yeah, I think focusing on those four things will help you achieve carbon neutrality. Um, and a lot of runners are pretty stoked on it right now, which is very exciting. Um, it's not super difficult as long as, you know, your event is not a massive event. Um, if it is a larger event, I would recommend definitely contacting one of those companies to get um, kind of a representative to work with. Cool. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Re really important uh, um, information. Um, so, so what, one of the things that uh, um, we kind of uh, came came out of the conference last year. I mean, you touched on several things in there as well. Um, but one of the things that really kind of came out for me was, um, you know, we uh, if we if we approach the problem, which you know, in terms of climate change, um, is you know, it's a it's a huge issue for us. Um, but if we approach climate change with the same thinking as we created the problem, then we're, we're not going to get the best solution. Um, and so, you know, one of the ways that uh, um, uh, um, that I've, I saw just recently something which uh, um, which I think is a great way of uh, uh, of kind of reframing our situation. You know, just having a different perspective. Um, and uh, um, yeah, we need to do things. I'll, I'll just share this with you. We need to do things that do not use the sky as a dump for our CO2 pollution. Um, and and I thought that's a really great kind of visual to have um, yeah. because you know typ typically we don't we don't think of um, you know that ev basically everything we do um, um, has some kind of CO two pollution pollution impact um, and um, but of course we don't normally think of that because we haven't had to you know it hasn't been hasn't been important well it, of course it now right. now it is critically important so uh, yeah. and so we need to approach things with a with a different yeah. mindset um, I so, love that. I love that. I mean, I always feel like the trail running community is using a space that is so beautiful that nature provides us. And if we are not taking responsibility to protect that, I don't know who is going to. Um, so I've, I've absolutely, I mean, that's a great visualization. Um, it's, it's accurate and yeah, definitely. And uh, it needs to be a focus moving forward. It, yeah. it does. It does. So th thank you so much, Amy. Um, yeah, really important information. So, so Briston, um, are you, uh, are you ready your rent? Okay. So I'll just, uh, yeah, get on over and, uh, um, that's a great picture of you, Briston there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I, um, my photographer that does my events, he, he took that picture. I thought it was a pretty good picture. So cool. Cool. Good one to share. Okay. All right. Um, Brisson, so uh, um, I'll mute myself and uh, hand over to you. So uh, um, thank you so much. Away you go. All right. Hey, y'all. My name is Brisson Rains, and I'm the race director, the Texas Division Race Director at Texas Outlaw Running. I started race directing two years ago when I was 18 years old, and I was in college, actually, my freshman year of college. I still am in college. And when I was 18 years old, I had this crazy idea to go and do a bunch of races. And I've been race directing for two years and I've race directed 11 races. Uh, I just did my 11th one two weeks ago. And a lot of it is what I like to call bootstrap race directing to where you're kind of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, creating your own brand, creating your own race, literally from nothing. And that's kind of like the artistic side of race directing is you're, you're creating something from nothing. And from that, I've learned a lot. And as we know, you know, you get wisdom through living through and doing things. And so I feel like I've gained some wisdom from actually going on, putting on these past 11 races. And so I'm super thankful to come on here and be able to share with y'all some things I wish I would have known when I first started that I didn't know, but I ended up learning the hard way. And so, Terry, I appreciate you uh, having me come on and be able to share that with everybody. If you can go and go to the next slide, we're going to hop right into it. So whenever I was race directing, I had this crazy idea to put on the hardest marathon in Texas in the middle of July. It was going to be in the heat. And whenever I went to the place to put this on, it's called the LBJ National Grasslands. And I met with one of the, the head guys that approves the events and I had a meeting with them. And I brought this little packet that had like the times and what time everything was going to start and the map of the trail. 
And literally, I know you needed a lot more than that to put on a race, especially a race like that. And the guy handed me an event packet and it was an event planning document. It had a event plan on it. That was the title of it. And it was from a race that a guy puts on there um, like six months before we were going to put that one on. And so the guy handed it to me and it had you know, event communication, participant checklist, like accounting for your participants. It had helicopter landing zones, all these things that I would have never thought of. And luckily, if it wasn't for him handing me that, I wouldn't have been able to put on all the races that I've put on because I've used that document, that event planning document for every race that I submit. So I put on a lot of races at state parks. And in order to get all that information to them, I put everything on the event planning document. It's super handy to have. And if anytime you're editing the website, if you do that, anytime you're just, you need to get information, you can always pull from that event plan document as kind of like a home base. And so there's a lot of things that are on there. If y'all need one, y'all could email me, texasoutlawrunning at gmail.com. I'll send you one of my race event plans and y'all could use that as a template. Uh, but you definitely need uh, at least like a six to eight page document PDF of all your stuff in there and so you go to the next slide um so whenever i wanted to put on the hardest marathon in texas a little bit i know i had a lot to go through before i could do that i put on three races before that one actually and those three races i used all that money to accumulate tents tables coolers things like that if it wasn't for those three races beforehand because i started with zero dollars i literally started from the ground up with infrastructure tents all these things and so you got to be realistic with the infrastructure you have you can't put on a 100 mile race and go to walmart and buy a few tents you need to have not only physical infrastructure such as tents tables things like that but you need um, support infrastructures with things like volunteers and people and if you're putting on a big 100 mile race right off the bat you have the supplies to support that but not only the supplies, but the people to be able to support it as well. So you need to be realistic because originally I wanted to put on a hundred mile race um, in July and I had no infrastructure to do that. So it ended up being a marathon, the 26.2 mile marathon, but um, on a trail, of course. But um, I, I learned from that and I learned how to be realistic and still like I want to put on a big 100 mile race in Texas, but I need to wait. And so I have a lot of the supplies I need to do that. And so you go to the next slide. So as far as event site planning goes, whenever you're submitting documents to state parks or national, national parks or whatever it is, you need to have a map of where your main tent's going to go, where the helicopter landing zone is going to be, where the porta potties are going to be. And what you can do is whenever you're doing this event site planning, um, you can rely on it. So whenever you show up, and actually start putting together the pieces like the start and finish line, things like that, you have the map to show you how you already plan to do it. And so it's just a super useful tool and it, it's really more helpful for the people that um, you're starting the race off at. So if you're starting at a park, it's really helpful for them to know what area you're gonna be using and how big it's gonna be. And you go to the next slide here. So this is something that um, I've learned over the past several races is that depending on the size of the race and the distance of the race depends on what type of food you use so I do put on like a little 5k and for that you know I have bananas but if I'm putting on a 50k race you need uh, things like pretzels and you just need something like something for everyone that everyone can eat that'll help get them through the race and when you get to big distances like 100ks or even 100 milers you need to start having um, you know, hot foods, cooked food, things like that. You got to really go big on the food. And one thing that uh, a participant walked up to me, she said, hey, you don't have any Mountain Dew. Can you please bring Mountain Dew? And so I started getting Mountain Dew. And I put Mountain Dew out at my aid stations. And honestly, at the last race, no one drank it. But because she told me that she wanted Mountain Dew, I'm going to have it at every single race because there's going to be somebody like her that comes along. And so you really have to get out of your own mindset of what you would like and really get to the mindset of what all the other runners are going to like as well. And so you can, there's like checklists online. I'm sure you could find um, that have like aid station food that you can use. And you just really need to be very, you need to have a very wide selection of food. Don't have an, don't be putting on a 50K race and have chips and that's it. And some oranges and bananas. You need to have a lot more than that. 
And so have a big variety as far as your uh, food at the aid station and plan it strategically. And to go to the next slide here, and this is the last one here, guys. Let's see, there we go. Excuse the plane flying over. Um, how to plan aid stations. The, I learned this a very hard rate. One of the first ever trail races I put on was the Chupacabra 50. It was a 50K, 50K in Northwest Texas. And I hadn't actually been there. I was in college. And so the entire event planned was for my computer. I didn't even visit the state park before I put the race on. And I learned that the hard way. And I on the map, I, I saw there was a road that was, um, you know, it was along the trail, but the only way to get to this place where I could put this aid station, it was a good spot for an aid station. They looped through it twice and it was a good area. And to get up there, there was this road and I saw it on Google Maps. There was like this little dirt road. I was like, oh, we could just drive up this road out here, go around the park, hop on the road. So we get there and the first day I, luckily I checked to see if the road like connected to where the aid station was. And we drive out there on this long dirt road and we get there after driving for about 20 minutes and there's a gate and the gate is locked and there's no, it's not owned by the state park and there's no way to get to, to where I was going to put the aid station. And so that's where you kind of have to bootstrap tough enough and do what you got to do because race directors, you're going to make it happen. If there's an aid station there and you told people there's going to be aid station, you're going to make sure there's an aid station in there. So the day before the race, we hiked up tables, water coolers, a mile up this ridge, up a trail. It was a very rugged trail and so we we just hiked it up on our backs and it was physically difficult and it was literally me and like three other guys that's all i had and but you got to do what you got to do and so we made it happen and so when you're planning your aid stations think through those things and try to actually look at it in person and be realistic my last race i put an aid station up that was two and a half miles up on a ridge that's the one i did two weeks ago and the park luckily they, I talked with them beforehand and they said that we could take a truck up there and put an aid station up there. And in the middle of the night, the aid station started running out of water. And I thought I put enough water up there, but it, we were just short of about five gallons of water. And so before it got too low, I had no, it was two o'clock in the morning. It was a night race. And I had no way to, to get the park rangers to drive me up there because everyone was asleep, you know? And so what I had to do was I got a five gallon jug or a six gallon jug, put it on the back of my mountain bike. And I hiked that mountain bike two and a half miles up this very, very tall ridge. I think it was a thousand foot climb for about two and a half miles. And this was like at two or three in the morning, middle of the night, but I got it up there and um, everybody was happy with that. So, you know, whenever you're planning your aid stations, you really think through it. And I'm really speaking on that from a lot of failures that I've had. And so those are the five things that I wish I would have known when I first started race directing. And if you have any questions, y'all could always, you know, email me, reach out to me. I have Instagram and uh, y'all can message me on there. So I appreciate it. Brilliant. Briston, thank you so much. Uh, you, you've got some great stories you shared there. <laughs> I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even, even Craig's rolling his eyes there. Um, I, I'm, and I'm sure you've had some stories as well, Craig. But, uh, um, but Briston, that's, uh, um, I remember it because it, uh, it was Fayetteville, wasn't it, that you, that you came to two years ago? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, yep. that was that was your that was your first, um, um, and I remember you there as eighteen years old, and uh, um, and you were you, you you kind of reminded me of myself when I was younger in some ways. You know, it was uh, um, uh, it was like you 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 kind of uh, gave me the impression that you're, you're you're kind of like a sponge, and and it's like you just couldn't get enough information. Um, at the conference, and uh, um, and it was uh, it was great that you took away, um, you know what what you what who you connected with, and the kind of different ideas um, that were shared with you, and, uh, and and basically got off and running. Um, and uh, I, I love I love your kind of bootstrap racing too. I think that's a great a great <laughs> great description. Um, but uh, but it's clear that you're um, uh, you're the kind of like you said, you know, you you've got you've got this set out. You've got runners out there. Let's get it done. Um, and find a way, yep. of course. And of course, you do find a way. Um, and so, so Briston, thank you so much. Hey, the um, um, I love your idea of the event planning document. Um, 
and with your permission, if you if you can share that with me, then when when I send out the recording um, tomorrow, I'll send out the recording link to everybody that's registered for this webinar, and I can I can include that event planning document on there. So to save your to save your inbox, then um, then I can send that out. So if you send that to me, if you, if you're okay with that, then I'll do that. Um, yeah. And, yeah, and I think that. that. Yeah, cool. Thank you. I think that would be a really helpful, uh, um, uh, really helpful thing to include because, uh, um, you know, it, it's it's one of these areas, and that that's part of the reason why um, uh, why I wanted to do this webinar is that is that you know so many uh, um, so many race directors are you know just on their own, um, and uh, um, you know they might reach out to somebody they know or some runners, but but in a lot of cases, then it's like uh, you know you you end up learning the hard stuff yourself. Um, and uh, so, uh, so if we can save some some pain for people, then uh, um, then hopefully we're doing a good thing. So, uh, so Briston, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, okay, Craig, let's move along. So, for for those of you that uh, that don't know, Craig is the uh, race director for the Western States 100 and uh, the Waldo 100K Trail Run. Um, uh, Craig, we've had the uh, we've had the honour to have you uh, uh, participate and pre present and moderate and do different things at the US Trail Running Conference before, and uh, wonderful to have you on here right now. So, uh, um, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, and uh, the uh, the web is yours. All right, thanks, Terry. Um, wow, Briston, you're you're so inspiring. I, I cannot believe. You started when you were 18 years old. I'm just blown away by that. I did. I don't know what I expected. I didn't. Uh, I didn't research either one of you, Amy or Briston. Um, wow, that is so awesome. And Amy, I don't know how you how old you are, but you're obviously much younger than I am. You're not going to tell us. <laughs> I'm 26. Oh my God. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm a little older than both of you. Uh, I started Waldo 21 years ago, and I was well into my career of uh, computer science. I had no, no experience with race directing. Um, that was quite an undertaking to put on a 100K, which did not overlap. It was a big, like, figure eight type of uh, a course and then 12 or 13 years after that i got the western states job and that that race had been going on for about 40 years when i took over so i've got the experience of a brand new race like like briston's talking about you know not knowing how to even get to the aid stations or can't if you can get to the aid stations and then a, a race that's been around for a lot of years and um, surprisingly, there were there were similar issues, uh, similar experiences for both me, uh, for both races. I'll, I'll start off um, with two easy things from Waldo. We can go to the first line, and then I'll go to my third and fourth are a little more uh, involved. When I started Waldo, there are so many things, as as Briston outlined, so many things that you don't even have a clue about that you have, to, you have to learn quickly. And one of the things that I, I did wrong was I just assumed that these volunteers that came from a non-running background, they were ski patrollers, that they knew the same things that I knew. And we had, we used potatoes, cooked potatoes and salt at the aid stations and we had we gave the potatoes to the captains. We got feedback at the end of the run, like, wow, the potatoes at one of the aid stations were, were not cooked. The aid station volunteer, the captain, didn't know that you were supposed to cook the potatoes before you put them out on the table for runners to eat. And my wife and I just, there's no way. <laughs> How could that not be known? So. Don't assume that your volunteers know everything that you know. One, one, more, one more quickie on that. Uh, on the same race, we had a volunteer. We had, we had a great communication system set up. Um, one volunteer came on the radio and said, number whatever, uh, bib number, was dropping out, but continuing on to the next aid station. 
right how are they how are they a dnf if they're going on right those are things that we just i i made the mistake of assuming that that everybody knew what a dnf was and that you didn't go on pretty simple thing but you can apply this to a lot of different areas don't don't assume that people know what you know uh, the second one, this is kind of an embarrassing one. <clears throat> Waldo started off, we were really small. They're like, I don't know, less than 20 finishers the first year. It took quite a few years to, to really get uh, big and, and require a lottery. And so we would, take, we would take registrations all the way up to, you know, right before the race started. And so I didn't order women's shirts because I just thought it was, it was, well, it was, it was just easier to order men's shirts. And I just kept doing that for about, I think it was four or five years until I finally got enough pressure from, uh, maybe it was even more than four years, uh, got some pressure from, from a friend. And she said, you got to do women's shirts. Like, is it really that big a deal? And the first year we had women's race shirts, they were technical shirts from Sport Hill. Um, Gretchen Brugman from, from uh, either Reno or somewhere in the Tahoe era wrote a blog post about her favorite shirts of all the races she ran that year. And Waldo made, made the list. And she talked about the fit. Like, oh my God, why did it take me so many years to appreciate that, that women really do want women's shirts and they look a whole lot better on them than a man's shirt. I know, pretty stupid, but that's what I did. Uh, so number three, we can go to the next slide. This one is a little bit, um, this is big. And and Briston talked about not being able to go to an aid station. He didn't know that there was gonna be a gate there and the state didn't, didn't, uh, um, didn't have access to it. Um, we recently had, we're having issues right now with Western states and some, some private land. And the, I don't know if this tool was available. It hasn't been available for that many years, but you can get the private land layer with Cal Topo, Cal Topo or Gaia app. For Cal Topo, you pay the $39 a year and you can, you can see all the private land owners and who who owns them you can see the private parcels and who owns them and my goodness western states goes through a lot more private land than i ever ever knew and this is a race that's been going on now we're, we're on 49th year since Gordy ran um that tool uh is instrumental now i don't know how i i did it without it and and briston if you don't use gaia uh, I suggest you get guy and pay the $39 a year and get the private land <laughs> information right there. <laughs> um, another, another thing I wish I had known is when you're designing a course and it goes across or near other agency boundaries, maybe, maybe in for service world, it could be another district. Um, if you have a trail that's right on those, those sections may get ignored because the other agency or the other district says, oh, well, that's their problem, or they maintain that. And we had several places where that, that was an issue. I wish I had known that ahead of time, and I, I would have um, just taken more ownership and, and, and said, we will, we will make sure this tra these trails are, are maintained. Um, that can also go between, you know, federal and state or, or Briston was going through national park and, and state park. Um, it doesn't mean you can't have trails or races that go across, but you might, you might be um, stepping into something that may be a little more complicated than, than you were aware of. Um, and then I also wish I had known about how the Pacific Crest Trail Association, uh, what their role was in conjunction with the Forest Service or the state parks or the state land. The PCTA, which it made um, a lot of news maybe six or seven years ago when Candace Burt was trying to put on one of her 200 milers and use part of the Pacific Crest Trail. And the PCTA, 
which manages or oversees the whole 2,600 mile Pacific Crest Trail, they said, no, she can't do that. And, and she, of course, you know, made a big deal about it. And the PCTA ended up contacting me, the Oregon Washington um, director contacted me and asked me for information, see if I could, I could kind of, um, you know, work to smooth the relationship out, and which I couldn't. But um, the PCTA has a has an oversight function, and they make a recommendation to the Forest Service. So the Forest Service actually issues the permit to use it, but the PCTA can say no. We don't want any more trail, any more races on the PCT. I had no idea of that relationship. Um, and that's, that's quite involved. And um, I don't know how you're gonna know these things when you first start out, but, but there's a lot of, um, lot of land issue, not just private, but, but the public agencies that, uh, you know, take those, um, don't take those for granted that, that, that it's gonna be easy because you can see a map that goes across, a, 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 you can see a trail that goes across a map. Doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be easy to. And then the last one, I'm gonna go to the last slide. Uh, I have two very different races. Waldo is a <laughs> less than $30,000, uh, budget and Western states is three quarters of a million, uh, getting closer to a million. So I got very two very very different extreme <laughs> events. <laughs> Some of the things about sponsorship are exactly the same. Um, I wished I had known um, about how much time um, managing sponsorship relationships um, actually takes. With Waldo, it's not as much because we don't have as many but one thing that i wished i had had early was a was a consistent um sponsorship um uh, sponsor deck or i don't know what they're called i think sponsor deck is what most people are calling them now and and try to be very consistent with each of the sponsors that you bring in so you don't have one that comes in at, a, at, a, at whatever dollar amount and then another one is three times the dollar amount with the same, with the same delivery of, of uh, you know, on, on the race on my part. Um, that would have helped a lot early on is try to be consistent. And I definitely encourage trying to get um, contracts with your, with your sponsors, preferably longer term contracts, not just one year. There are reasons why a one year agreement may be good, especially if you're just starting out and you don't really have, you, you don't have much value to them. Um, but in two years or three years, you're going to have a whole lot more value. So it's hard to value what you're going to be worth in, in three years. Um, but once you get somewhat established, you know, a three to five year agreement with your sponsors would be, uh, would be preferable. So you don't have to go and renew those agreements every year, which, which are not easy, um, especially when, when the lawyers get involved on both sides, um, <laughs> then, they, then they can really drag out and eat a lot of your time. Um, one thing that I found out this year, uh, I don't know if you guys, if anybody saw our live cast, our live broadcast of Western States this year, but um, that was a self-funded, project uh, to the tune of a little over $100,000 to, to produce it. And I had no idea that, that, that brands, um, and there may be brands watching this, I don't know who's on here, maybe, maybe some of my sponsors are here. Um, so brands have a fixed amount of money for sponsorship and they're using that, that's usually allocated at the beginning of their fiscal year. And you can't go back and say, "Hey, can I get another? Can I get another X thousand dollars from you, from that sponsorship pool?" Because they've allocated that for the whole year, but they do have advertising money that they can they can throw at you and in a freaking heartbeat. And this blew me away. 
if we have we have existing sponsors who I couldn't even get another thousand dollars out of. I couldn't even imagine getting another thousand dollars. And then they would they would sign an agreement for fifteen thousand dollars as part of the the webcast, which just I had no idea that there were different pools of money uh, for these brands. And the sponsorship line is much harder to get money out of. So those are the those are four things I wish I had known. <laughs> Any of those could we can talk for a long time, or the last uh, two at least. Brilliant, Craig. Sorry, I had uh, trouble finding my mute button there, um, or unmute button. Um, brilliant, Craig. Thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, that's. Uh, um, I think. Uh, um, yeah, I mean that's uh, um, th that is mind blowing, isn't it? As you said, you know the the. I mean, and, unless unless you're you know you've you've had some experience in the brand market, then you know you wouldn't know that piece about the the, you know, the advertising budget. But but yeah, you're right. There's different different pots of money that are available, and uh, um, and so it's then just asking asking the right questions, isn't it? I guess, um, and and that's a bit like the uh, the intricacies of trail access and ownership. Um, as well as there's like you know you you have to I, th I think it's really important for uh, for us as race directors to ask questions, um, but then of course we might not get the answer that we want, <laughs> but at least at least we know what we're, we're dealing with, um, and uh, it kind of reminded me what uh, what you were saying kind of reminded me I I, um, I helped to put on a, a a brand new trail race here in Estes Park, um, and uh, um, actually on my local hill and uh, um, and so we uh, we applied for a permit. Um, and uh, we actually didn't get the permit um, until seven days before the race date. And so we had everything set up, but we couldn't advertise the race until we actually had the permit in our hands. And so, but we had everything set up. So that, like a suit, the minute we had the permit, it was like, okay, we've got seven days now to let everybody know what we're doing. And, and so, so we kind of put the word out, but unofficially, um, uh, kind of in the local, uh, local running groups. And so we were able to, to say, hey, hey, save the date, but, but don't, don't make it definite yet. <laughs> and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, um, uh, so, so good, Craig. Thank you so much. And, uh, um, um, yeah, the, um, I didn't realize, you know, through a number of years that I've known you that, uh, um, that you actually started Waldo. Um, I, I wasn't sure about that. So, uh, um, yeah. Yeah. I started and I, I've tried to retire a couple of times as race director and now I'm, I'm back at it. I'm, I'm not very good at retiring. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you got you got lots of many years left in you, Craig. Yet, so uh, so yeah, there's, there's there's still time to plan for that. <laughs> okay, all right. So, um, 1152. Uh, let's see if we've got we've got no um, no questions popped up on on there. Um, so um, the uh, what I was thinking was um, um, that you're. Um, uh, you, you've all been connected through through to, to me um, and then this webinar through the US Trail Running Conference. Um, so, um, um, so Amy, I, I wanted to ask you a, a, a question. I mean, you've kind of touched on this, but uh, um, uh, but I just wanted to uh, um, put you on the spot if you don't mind me doing that. Um, and uh, um, kind of what was your what was your biggest takeaway from the from the conference? And and last year was the first time you went, wasn't it? Um, so, yeah, if you yeah. don't mind sharing something on that. Sure. I mean, last year was my first time there. It was awesome. I mean, I learned more than I could have hoped to learn. Um, and prior to that, I had thought of starting the running kind, but I hadn't really pulled the plug on that. I wasn't sure what my brand was going to be. Um, and really through conversations with you and Claire, who I met, um, through native, um, I realized the sustainability piece was the piece I was most passionate about. Um, and so, I mean, I definitely would not have developed a relationship with native energy, I don't think, um, if it wasn't for the US Trail Conference. Um, and that was definitely, that's definitely been the biggest um, asset that I've <clears throat> encountered or, you know, relationship I've developed um, that I feel like has really helped me better understand the um, environmental impact of hosting a trail race and also the steps required to actually lessen that impact or decrease it 
so much to be a negative impact. Cool, cool. So, so the running kind is is uh, so for for race directors that are out there um, who perhaps need meet, need some help and guidance in terms of their um, uh, achieving a carbon neutral race. Then, um, then they can reach out to you and you can help them with that. Definitely. Um, my email with the running kind is we are the running kind at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. um, or we are on Instagram and Facebook as well um, at the running kind with an underscore at the end. Um, so yeah, definitely reach out with any questions on how to, how to move your race to be carbon neutral or more sustainable. Um, I have brand recommendations for sure. Um, and also, uh, I wrote up a little, um, uh, article that American Trail Running Association will be including in their new, um, guide this fall. So that'll be a piece of that. Great. Great. Well, congratulations, Amy. I mean, it's uh, when I met you last year, I, I, I knew that uh, you definitely had the, um, the passion and the energy and enthusiasm to, to go places. And so it's great to see you putting that into action. Thank you. It's been yeah. fun to, uh, to start a little running company and we'll see where it takes me. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely briston so um so two two years ago you you came to fayetteville for the conference the first time and uh, um uh, and then you came along last year as well didn't you and uh, um uh, so um yeah what's what was your your kind of biggest takeaway from the from the conference that uh, that you can share yeah so the past two years that i've went um i i would say the biggest things that i've learned from them was just how just just the basics of race directing so the first year i learned like what software you to use to map out trails and just the real basic foundational things and then the second year i learned a lot more about sustainability and how to be more sustainable within my races and um, be more you know environmentally friendly that's something that's I, i'm really striving for with the races we're doing so okay Oh, I stopped my screen sharing. Okay. Uh, can I ask a question? Oh, of course you can. Briston, how large are your events, um, like, on average? Um, they're anywhere from 20 people to over, like, 100 to 110 people. It just depends on which one in the format. The last man standing, of course, last year was about 20-ish people, but uh, we've had okay. some in the hundreds, so. Cool. Awesome. I was just curious. After I heard Craig, I was like, oh my God, I don't even know how I would start to make those events carbon neutral. I mean, those, those are huge. So yeah, that's about what I have at my events as well. Cool. 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 All right, Craig. Um, so, so you've been to the conference quite a few times now, um, both, both in Estes Park and, uh, um, uh, did you come to, I can't remember if you came to, uh, um, to California, but, um, maybe not at that time, but, uh, I, I have only been to Estes Park Yeah, cool. and I came just to see the elk. That was, great. <laughs> that was your biggest takeaway. Oh, no, no. That was definitely awesome to see the see the streets just completely stopped because there's elk in the street like strutting around um the yes. best part for me as as i i wrote a couple times and you shared it is is the the networking uh, i've met so many people there I, I met dale garland there i i didn't i had never yeah. met dale in person except at the conference um and yeah keith peters i it just been it, it's the networking the, the content is great too mm -hmm. but the the, the stuff that you do afterwards so you go out to dinner you hang out in, in the breaks and you talk to other other race directors and share ideas um yeah. and i'm definitely energized by younger people amy and briston I'm, I'm energized and i don't want to just be this old curmudgeon that's been doing something <laughs> for so many years i love hearing new ideas I, I i'm so energized by both of you right now you can't believe it i really am <laughs> so um it's cool I know. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Craig. It's uh, it works the same for me too. I'm I'm, I'm an even older curmudgeon, and uh, so <laughs> it's uh, it's it, but it's great. Seriously, it is great to have uh, um, you know new new people, young young blood, young ideas uh, um, um, coming into the sport, and uh, um, and and it's uh, you know I I I think it's such an important piece because 
you know, we, we old curmudgeons, you and I, Craig, are going to retire at some point. And uh, so, so we, we need to have somebody to hand over to. And uh, which, uh, um, which reminds me that I'll, uh, um, I'll, I'll maybe talk to, uh, um, to, to Amy and Briston uh, um, on a separate, uh, separate thing about the conference at some point, because uh, I'm going to need to hand that over at some day. So, uh, um, so we can yeah. talk about that in the future. Um, okay, so um, we're coming up to, uh, to noon. So um, uh, thank you so much, everybody out there for, uh, uh, for participating. Um, and uh, just to give you a heads up, we, um, we've just added to the schedule, we're going to have a, um, an additional, um, additional voicemail um, on, sorry, additional webinar on uh, uh, August 25th. Um, at uh, 11 o'clock on effective sponsor partnerships. So, so neatly segueing on from where, uh, from where Craig closed off there. Um, and uh, so, um, yeah, thank you so much, everybody out there. Um, big round of uh, thanks for, um, for our panelists. And uh, um, I just had a note saying that uh, chat appears to be disabled. So, so that explains why uh, we haven't had anybody uh, um, on the chat. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, folks, for that. I didn't, I didn't realize that I could, uh, um, I could disable it. But uh, um, anyway, I'll uh, stop the screen share. And um, um, yeah, thank you to our panelists, Amy, Craig, Briston. Um, uh, appreciate you uh, so much joining us and uh, um, sharing your experiences and thoughts. And uh, um, been a really great webinar. And uh, um, I hope. Hopefully this has been helpful to um, to either the folks in uh, out there watching live or the folks that see the recording too. Um, and Briston, thank you. I hope you're driving safe. And uh, <laughs> I always get a little bit scared when I see people <laughs> driving driving during the webinar. But uh, um, yeah, take care, everybody. And uh, um, yeah, be good to each other. Be good to our planet. And uh, um, let's see what we can do to uh, to change the world through trail running. Bless you all. Thanks, Terry. Okay. Thank you, Terry. I'm going to stop the recording.